National Park. Um, so this is actually one of the very first owl photos that I have ever taken. This is when I was eight years old. I think I was either eight and a half or maybe nine uh, when I got my first owl photo. And this is a snowy owl on uh, Vancouver, BC during the eruption year of 2011. It was 2011 and 2012, they had, um, uh, it was just snowy owls came down in the masses and we saw 50 snowy owls in one day along this this dike, this boardwalk, and you could just see them. And since they are from the Arctic, um, they do not like trees. So they'll perch on the ground or on these um, this driftwood logs by the, by the water. And it was just absolutely incredible to see them. And I think when I was younger, I didn't appreciate them as much as I probably should have. Um, but now I, of course, do, and I'm really glad I had these opportunities as a kid to meet owls. Uh, this is another one of my very first photos. This was taken when I was nine, also in Vancouver, BC. This is my first sawwood owl I ever saw, and uh, she was very sleepy and hiding in the bushes, and I think she opened her eyes because we had um, a hawk that was flying around, and she was like, oh, that's a, little, that's a little scary. So yeah, it's one of the first owl photos. So then fast forward a few years later, um, owls were not always my first love. I actually really focused on orcas, killer whales in the Puget Sound region. And I actually worked on a whale watching boat for a couple seasons and I educated guests about um, just our ecosystem and the Puget Sound and the different whales we have and pinnipeds and marine life. And um, unfortunately, uh, whale watching the Southern Resident Killer Whales became illegal in 2018 because they are a critically endangered species and whale watching boats were kind of being a little bit too pushy on them. And so they decided that um, it would be best not to watch the whales anymore. So following that, I kind of, um, it was an in-between moment for me because I had just gotten, you know, I'm finished watching whales and I don't really have the in to go on the whale watching boats or go watch the whales anymore. Cause you know, I'm not on a whale watching boat and I can't, I don't have access to that. And so, I was kind of like figuring out, you know, what's going to be next for me. And that November of 2018, I'm up in Canada uh, visiting family and we found this beautiful long-eared owl as pictured here. And she was just so calm and just those glowing yellow eyes and her ears were just breathtaking. And I just remember looking into her eyes and I'm like, I want to see more of these birds. And of course, I had photographed them when I was younger, but I had never really fully grasped just their beauty until I was up, up close and personal with this long-eared owl. So then after I uh, got into, started getting into owl photography, I really started focusing on my more backyard owl species. And in Washington state, the most common owl species we have are the barred owl and the great horned owl for urban areas in Western Washington. They just inhabit pretty much any urban park, anybody's backyard, there's always a barred owl in there or a great horned owl tucked up in the conifers. And I was just, I really wanted to focus on these species because they were so common and they live close to my house. And so this is how I went about finding them. So this is a barred owl and uh, barred owls are native to the majority of the West Coast, but mostly the Pacific Northwest, as well as throughout the East Coast. And uh, they're also found up in a band throughout um, the can Canadian provinces. Um, they're quite a recognizable owl just based on their large size. They're about two feet tall and um, they're just these big, strikingly beautiful owls. And um, so how I started photographing them was we had a lot of them calling in our local parks, but at, it was past dark and you know you can't get a good photograph when they start calling. And so what I started to do was I would listen to their calls and I would track them down through the woods. And then when I had found a spot that they were calling from right after sunset, I would, I would mark that pin location in my phone and I would return in the morning. And to my surprise, I started finding owls like crazy because if I'm able to find their habitual roost, they tend to roost in the same spots, you know, day after day. And it, it might not be in the same tree, but in that same stand of trees, they usually tend to um, stick to. So I started doing that and all of a sudden I, I'm, I'm finding all these owls. So here's a, here's a great horned owl. And um, these ones, they make the, the classic hoo, 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 noise. And it's almost, almost, you know, you can hear it from anywhere. It's just that that's, that's an owl, it's the classic owl noise. So following these sounds into the forest and then pinpointing the locations. And then I'd be able to come back in the morning and scour for 30 minutes to a couple hours. And eventually, you know, you'd find the roosting spot for this, you know, the particular bird. 
So that's one of my number one tips in helping people find their first owls because many people, you know, in their, just in their backyards, they hear owls all the time at night. You know, I get questions, you know, I hear owls in my backyard all the time, but I never see them. You know, how am I, how should I go about finding these birds? And that's just it. Listen to those calls and track them down through the woods and you can find, you know, their spot in your backyard. So here's another one of those barred owls. Um, another great way to find owls is uh, looking for whitewash and pellets. So whitewash is actually owl poop. And owls, since they're roosting in the same spot habitually day after day, um, they're obviously going to be excreting a lot of their droppings on the same tree and, the, and on the forest floor. So if you are looking in the same, in that stand where you're trying to find a certain owl, or maybe you'd heard reports of one in your local park, but you're not quite sure what tree it's in, start looking underneath the trees and even in the branches of the trees. If you see a bunch of white streaking in the trees that's not tree sap or pellets on the ground, which are just owl pellets, they regurgitate their uh, food that they had eaten, they'll regurgitate the fur and the things they can address, uh, digest bones and such. So the, they'll come out in a little pellet that's pretty small. It's about an inch to two inches, depending on the, on the bird species. Um, on the owl species, but yeah, just looking underneath the trees for this, these clear signs that an owl has been living there, you can, you know, help identify this is the tree that they will be in, and you can check it over and over again. Here's another one of my um, local barred owl, his name is Poncho, and um, I found him mostly by following his calls after, after dark, that was the main way I found him, but also he has a couple habitual roosts, conifers that he roosts in, and you can just see underneath, it's just lined with years and years of disgusting, rotting pellets of old meat and fur and bones, and um, you can see all the white whitewash marks on the tree that he likes to sleep in. So here's another photo of them in the woods. I love that. But um, another great tip in finding these birds for yourself is using uh, apps or they're also on the internet called eBird and iNaturalist. These are great ways to find owls, but you gotta be, you have to make sure you're being ethical and respectful about it. And the best way I can explain this is owls are, you know, everyone really wants to see owls and they're quite a, a popular subject for photography and wildlife photography. And so oftentimes if an owl's location gets exploited through the internet, um, sometimes people can show up in groups of 30 to 50 people a day photographing the same bird, which can be really harmful to the animal. So if you use apps like eBird and iNaturalist, which help give you general to pinpoint locations of birds, it's best to go to locations that haven't been reported again and again and again. So if you can find a local spot near your house where you see somebody who has um, reported, you know, a barred owl, a great horned owl in the park near your house, like that's great and go out and find them. And it's, that's a great way to start finding the general locations of these birds is just using these apps like eBird and iNaturalist to just look up the species and then it'll show you hot spots in the area where people have reported them. But if, but remember, like if you do see like lots of people have been going to the spot, it might be best to hold off for a different opportunity. Here's another one of those barred owls from my local park. They do blend in quite well. So another tip in finding these owls is um, looking for inconsistencies in the tree. So as you can see here, he does really blend in well with that bark, but he is an inconsistency. And even though this photo is cropped and you're only seeing this, there's no context. This is, you know, a dense forest and it might be hard to spot an owl if he's, you know, 30 feet up looking like this in the tree. But I just like look for the inconsistencies and I've trained my eye um, slowly over time, it took quite a while to start just seeing the different shapes. And I usually look for like a football like shape or a shadow in the tree. And usually they appear as a shadow in the darkness and you'll just see that odd shape. And it's usually an owl because owls, unlike other raptors like hawks and such, you know, hawks are bouncing around, they're going from perch to perch. Usually during the day, owls are quite calm and um, sedentary. So they just, they, they tend to stay in the same spot unless they're hunting, they just sit quietly in, in their perches. And so it can be a bit difficult to spot them because you don't have that movement that you do with other raptors, but it is a great, a great way to just look for those shadows and silhouettes in the tree, as well as just inconsistency, like a glitch in the matrix, basically. 
here's one of those great horned owls. This is um, one I was trying to get a, a, a sunburst down in the bottom, bottom right hand corner by going with a high um, F stop. So then it comes to nesting season is also a great way to start getting some photographs of owls. Owls are very, very active in nesting season as the adults are having to care for the young and catching a lot of food for the young. They have to fly around and they're constantly awake, constantly expending energy and hunting. Um, and these babies need the food, so they start screaming. They're loud. So these little barred owl babies um, will hiss. They'll go, they'll like make these little hissing, screechy noises. And that is one of the greatest ways to find owls, especially in the spring months, is going to your local park and listening for these noises. And um, the barred owls will make themselves known. You can hear them from like a mile away. And they'll just be, they'll be hissing and screaming, and that's their begging for food. So going out in springtime and listening for these sounds, the barred owls make the hissing noise. Great horned owls make this um, kind of a chirping, barking noise. That's what the juveniles, their call is. And um, just identifying these different juvenile, depending on what species you have in your area, identifying the juvenile calls going out in springtime, you will hear them. And I have, that's how I found um, these guys actually, as we were just walking through an area that had reports of a barred owl and we started hearing the hissing and we followed it into the woods. And sure enough, here's three baby, baby barred owls sitting on a branch. Same for the great horned owls, as I mentioned before, they make a, it's like, it's like a little barking chirp noise. And um, they, they're a little bit more active around dawn and dusk. Barred owls, babies, I've, I've noticed to be a little bit more crepuscular in their activity, but, uh, or sorry, daytime in their activity, but the great horned owls have been a little bit more crepuscular, which means they're more active at, at dawn and dusk. So that's when they'd be begging for food, mostly. So then I get the questions about photographing and finding a little bit more of the elusive and rare species like the great gray owl. Um, great gray owls are found throughout the West in um, California, Washington, Oregon, Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, as well as Minnesota and throughout Canada. They are quite a targeted bird species for most photographers as they are just charismatic. They're they're breath breathtaking animals and they're so they're in they're so inquisitive and they'll come up and they'll approach you. I mean, this guy flew right at me and it's just it's phenomenal to be in their presence. So of course everyone would love to to spend some time with them. So great gray owls uh, tend to be quite elusive, and the main reason for that is their camouflage. As you can tell in this picture, he is the exact tones of that tree. And it can be definitely really hard if they're roosting during the day it's almost impossible to spot them. So gray gray owls are, depending on the subspecies and uh, where their population is found, they tend to be mostly crepuscular, meaning again, they're um, hanging out in dawn and dusk, mornings and evenings. And uh, that's their most activity hours other than nesting time. And in Washington state, they usually only come out only 30 minutes before sunset. They can be quite difficult to photograph as they, really stick to that crepuscular schedule. So finding these owls, they are most common, their population is most densely populated in Alberta, Canada, as well as BC. And there's great population of them in Yellowstone National Park, the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, the Tetons, um, great population of them in Oregon, specifically Southern Oregon and Eastern Oregon as well as uh, pockets of Idaho and pockets of Washington, but those aren't super great places to see them. And then of course, Minnesota at the um, Saxon Bog, which is quite a um, famous place to see the great gray owl. So when it comes to finding these birds, the best tip I have for people is going out at dawn and dusk. And for great grays, it is so important to see them hunting. And that's why it's, and that's why I suggest going out at dawn and dusk, because that's when they will be active and they will be hunting. And I suggest looking very low, because great gray owls love to hunt from low perches like this one. So he's maybe only four and a half, five feet off the ground right here. And he was able to capture a bowl or two in the um in the snow right right below him right where he's perched so looking for great gray owls try not to think high even though they are a big bird they don't tend to um, perch in the big trees they actually tend to perch on fence posts uh this little 
I guess, wishbone perch he's on is like this small stump. Fences, they'll perch on top of small conifers. So they really like to um, hunt from a low vantage point, which a lot of people, I think, misjudged. Um, there are different subspecies of great gray owl. This is an example of that. The one on the right is a great gray owl I photographed in Alberta. Um, this, this population of great grays really tends to love those mature growth forests adjacent to bogs and meadows that they're able to hunt in. So um, he's in this fir forest that's mixed with a bit of pine. But then the subspecies on the left is a bird I photographed in Oregon. And you can tell they're actually quite quite physically different. These are two adult males. Uh, the one on the left is about, I'd say, six years old, and the one on the right is about five years old. Um, they, do quite, they do really look quite different, and you can tell that in the facial disc and as well as the way their bodies are shaped. Is, that's not a great um, way to tell, considering them. they can change their body posture quite easily, but they do have quite different looks to them. So this is really important when it comes to finding owls is you really need to understand the species where you live because owls do are not universal in their habits and even the same species like these two great gray owls here act completely differently. And that is a lot very surprising to many people. Well, the one on the right from Alberta he hunts regularly in the afternoons, like in the middle of the day, right? So 12 o'clock, 1 p.m., he'll be out in, out in the uh, field hunting for bulls, whereas this guy on the left would much rather be hunting in the mornings and evenings. So understanding your the species in the area that you live is really important. So getting that research done and um, I highly suggest uh, the Cornell Labs of Ornithology gives uh, great insights into these birds' habits and, um, and just their different, just the different populations based on um, based on where you live and the different subspecies. I think it does a great job at explaining at explaining that. So Cornell Lab of Ornithology is a great way to learn more about these birds and doing your research a bit before you go out and photograph them. Um, another species that is quite the goal for many photographers throughout the West is the northern pygmy owl, which is quite, quite a fun little species. They're only about four and a half to five inches tall, sometimes six inches. And they're just these little balls of fluff, practically, that perch low and sometimes high, uh, but usually, usually low. And they are diurnal, so they're hunting at all hours of the day. And they're actually quite common, but often unnoticed because they're small size. So the way I go about finding these owls are I look for tennis balls in the trees and they tend to be out in winter when they are migrating to the lower elevations um, below the snow line. And so they're at the foothills of the mountains. That's usually where you're gonna find the Northern pygmy owl or usually around 2000, 3000 feet in Washington state specifically. And um, just driving up and down rural farm farm roads and looking in the trees, I just try and look for these little tiny tennis balls. And usually they're silhouettes. So I just look for these little balls in the trees. And sometimes I have to do a double take because it might be might be a bird's nest. It could be a, a sparrow. I mean, they, they really do look like little birds from, from a distance. But once you get up close to them, it's like, oh, that is definitely an owl. So Definitely looking for those, those little tiny tennis ball shapes in the trees. They're most active, again, throughout the day as they're a diurnal species. And um, yeah, they're, they're all over the place, especially Washington, Oregon, California. They're very common, and as well as in Idaho, Montana. Um, great little species out here in the West to photograph. So now uh, diving into a little bit more about how I go about photographing owls. Um, I really like recently, I've been trying to move away from um, getting just like the trophy portrait shots. And I want to build a little bit more, you know, context to my owls and get a, like a little bit more creative with my photography. And so I've been working on that recently. This one is a, a pygmy owl. You can see his beak in the upper left hand of the screen. And this is his belly fluff that is covering his wings. And I just thought that was a very interesting composition. Um, but then going along with that, getting that context, 
I've really been trying to include a little bit more of the environment with my um, owl photography. And, you know, we've all, you know, we all love and appreciate a good portrait up close, tight, that sharp detail shot of an owl's face. Um, but I'm starting to like, I feel like a lot of these shots have been overdone. And as I'm taking my pictures and as I'm getting closer and closer, trying to get that feather detail and trying to get the nice portrait, I started thinking to myself, you know, what do I want to do with my photos? And I started thinking, you know, a, a lot of my audience really, really loves those tight trophy shots, but what can I achieve with my creative liberties and how can I move around and change my position and my perspective to share with, um, with my audience. And so I started backing up for my subjects to try and just capture a little bit more of the story and in the image. So then this was the, one of the very first times I ever tried this. This is a Northern pig meow sitting on top of a ponderosa pine tree. And as the sun was setting over the hillside, just this beautiful glow of um, this golden light started seeping through the ponderosa pines in the background. And I was like, there's no way, I, I, I can't just ignore this, this beautiful color. And so I, I had to back up. So I started backing up and I, I took a couple pictures and I'm like, wow, this really gives you context into the habitat of the Northern Pygmy Owl. Like what, what do they like to sit on? You know, you got some snow in here, so they must be at some higher elevations. And I feel like it just tells so much more of a story to the bird to uh, incorporate some of those environmental aspects. So going along with that, I just started to try and get a little bit more creative with my photography. And here is a, a long-eared owl in the brambles in Washington. And that we had just had a light snowfall the previous day. And after about two hours of scouring the brambles, trying to find one of these elusive birds, um, we happened to spot this one. And she was just tucked in this perfect little corner so we could overexpose and get her just, you know, surrounded by these snowy, these snowy brambles. And that was a great, a great way to start my more creative photography. So here's another one of those. Um, we, we always love the flight shots of them coming straight at us, you know, with their talons open and the wings outstretched. But I really wanted to get a little bit more of the environment in this shot particularly. So I backed up and I'm shooting this at about, I think about 300 millimeters. This is when I was still using my 150 to 600 Sigma lens for the majority of the time. So this is actually zoomed out quite a bit, but I really wanted to encompass those beautiful snowy evergreens. And this really tells a story to Washington because we are known for our evergreen trees and we're known for you know, our mountains and the snowy mountains in wintertime. So I felt like this told an amazing story to the Great Grace Habitat here in Washington, those high elevation uh, fir forests. And I was happy to capture this image. So short-eared owls are also a uh, common owl species here in the wintertime in Washington state. And I have a lot of friends that go out and photograph them quite religiously. And every weekend they're out there, you know, day and night, they gotta have to, they stay in the mud and in, in the rain throughout it all, trying to get that perfect head-on flight shot of the short-eared owl. And for the longest time, I followed in suit of that, um, of that, I guess, approach to photographing the shorted owls, just trying to get the best flight shot imaginable. And I wasted a lot of compositions focusing on the flight shots. In fact, I missed the majority of the good images that I would have achieved just because I was too focused on trying to get a nice flight shot. So this year I decided to move away from that and I wanted to get a little bit more context to the shorted owls. Where do these birds live? And, you know, we're always seeing these gorgeous flight shots of them, but what about them as a species and what can tell us a little bit more about them? So this was captured a couple weeks ago and I just, I happened to see the shorted owl that was flying across the marsh and she landed up on this on this twig. And my first, my initial reaction was I'm zooming in, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get my uh, my crop mode on so I can get a really nice tight um, portrait of her sitting up on the snag because it looks so beautiful. And then I thought, wait a minute, we know better than this. We gotta, we got a little, we gotta incorporate this beautiful environment. So I switch out my lenses and I get a smaller millimeter lens on there and I go to compose the shot. And I was just astonished at the beauty and the story that this image was able to tell. And it, it just, it really completes 
the scene for me to see, you know, we got the cattails. So this owl is hunting in a marsh and we got the body of water behind her and the mountains behind her. And I was just, um, it was just been a great, it's just been a great journey to try and encompass a little bit more creativity into my owl photography. This one is another environmental shot for great gray owls showing that they love those uh, high elevation pine and coniferous forests. Here's a northern pygmy owl with the sun setting behind her. Um, this was a, a great day out looking for pygmy owls. Sometimes the pygmy owls will come up, you know, by the grouse and they, they got like, you know, dozens of pygmy owls a day going out and finding them here or there. They're, you know, there's one, there's one. And then other days you go out and you can't find a single one. So this was one of those days where I had spent the entire morning and I had seen them and they were perching on top of wires and on top of posts and it just wasn't a great compelling scene. And so I kept on looking for another, another cooperative bird and I'm looking and looking and the sun is just about to set. And I thought, you know, it's over, it's over for pygmy shots this weekend. And my dad happened to notice a little bird fly out of the corner of his eye. I thought maybe it could be a pygmy. So we turned around and we go search drive up and down, trying to see what he saw. And there he is, right there in the brambles. He was sitting down in the brambles hunting. And when he saw our car stop, he looks up at us and I'm like, yep, that's a pygmy. So we watched this bird for maybe, uh, you know, a good five, 10 minutes. And then he flew and landed right on top of this beautiful fir tree. And as the sun was setting behind him and it was almost, we only had like a couple minutes left of light. <laughs> And I was able to snap this image and it really, it completed the day for me. Um, another one of those environmental shots. This is a Northern spotted owl, which is an endangered species of owl here in Washington state. And this particular bird has made his home in a black oak and madrone forest, which was just phenomenally gorgeous. It was, it was just, oh, it was breathtaking. This, it was just the moss hanging down. It was this whimsical scene and it was a spotted wonderland. And so I put on my shorter lens and I wanted to encompass some of this environment. So I got this female spotted owl per posing for me, perched on this, um, this oak and she's just looking out and it was just a great moment to help, you know, capture her with her environment and help speak for saving our mature growth and old growth forest to help save the Northern spotted owl's habitat. And I think I'll be using this photo later for conservation purposes to help explain the story of spotted owls and the importance of their old growth habitat. Uh, this is a great gray owl. I really wanted to get a photo of a great gray diving into the snow. And so I was waiting and waiting and waiting for this one owl that had uh, its hunting meadow had been blanketed over by a good two feet of snow. And he was he was waiting and waiting. He wasn't, he wasn't diving, he wasn't diving. I'm, I was about to give up and head home. And all of a sudden he glides over the snow, tilts his head back and forth and bloop, into the snow he goes. And I was like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. So I reposition and I, I really wanted to get, I was really um, focused on the slopes of the snow because I loved the way that the evening light was just hitting the slopes of the snow. So I wanted to um, incorporate that and not just have a portrait of an owl. And I wanted to make sure that the snow was incorporated in the shot here. Uh, here's a longered owl in one of the brambles near my house. These owls are quite elusive. Um, one of the best ways I have found to find them is just stay in the car. And um, I've actually been considering getting a camo blanket for my car and just like a little hole to shoot from out the window because they are so skittish and it's really hard to have an encounter with them with them being comfortable in your presence. So I'll just stay in the car and I'll roll at about two miles per hour past the brambles, but not stopping, just rolling slightly. And I can see, and I'll just like look through and look for any inconsistency, any football or dark shaped object I'll have will slowly slow down to one mile per hour, reverse and identify it. And then we'll reverse back again and then go forward slowly. Cause as soon as you stop the car, they could have the potential to fly. It depends on the bird. Um, sometimes this bird in particular, we were very lucky. Um, the owl seemed unbothered by us. So we were able to stop the car and we were actually able to get out and shoot the owl. And it was completely, it was completely comfortable with our, um, 
with our presence, which was surprising. But usually these birds, we got to stay in the car and I just shoot at one mile per hour while I have a friend or my parent drive and just get those shots. But yeah, best way to find these birds is just going really slow and just looking for those, the glitch in the matrix, that inconsistency in the brambles, because they will hide themselves, bury themselves down deep in these branches. Here's another one of those northern pygmy owls, little tiny guys out in eastern Washington. This one was, um, I was really proud of this year as I was trying to focus more on my creativity and my photography. And um, this was again, one of those situations where the owl was very, very close to me. And I had the option of getting, getting nice, nice close portrait shots. And I was really considering it. I really wanted to get in close for a nice, a nice portrait. But then I reminded to myself that I really want to try this creative avenue. So I back up and um, I start shooting and I was just amazed in post-processing how these colors came out with like the blues and the oranges and the yellows. I just, I just loved the shot from this year. And I, I was really happy that I was able to think a little bit more creatively rather than getting close to the bird and trying to get uh, a sharper portrait image. Here's one I was practicing a little bit with my lighting techniques with a long-eared owl. Again, one of those owls I found in those brambles. Um, just driving by really slowly and I finally saw this bird and it was highlighted by this gorgeous just sunbeam of light that was shooting through it. This was shot around noon, so really harsh light shining down on this bird. And a lot of photographers are feeling like, oh, harsh light, that is not a time to photograph owls. I don't want to photograph owls in harsh light but you can really get some cool compositions with the shadows if you practice um, your exposure in harsh light. So this is actually underexposed quite a bit to really, so you can see the right-hand side of the owl is completely blacked out. You can't see it at all. And that was helped with a little bit in post to help darken some spots and whatnot. But just darkening this, um, darkening my exposure, and I'm able to just have this one window of this beam of light shining down on this bird. And it really made for an interesting composition as I had this geometric owl shape here and everything else is just this dark and moody. And I think this was uh, one of the images I was working towards for my um, like photos that evoke emotion and power. And that was um, a project I was doing. And mostly in July this year, I was trying to work with my um, underexposing and harsh light. And I captured quite a few images like this one of other owl species as well. And um, it was really, it was really a cool, cool way to experiment with my lighting. So now uh, I, I kind of want to get into owl ethics. And this is a, this is really important to owl photography. As I mentioned earlier, owls are such a popular, popular subject to photograph for wildlife photographers. I mean, everything about them is just, it reels you in those eyes. They're so, they're relate, relatable sentient beings and they're just, great subjects. And so a lot of times owls have unfortunately brought out the worst in us. And I can admit to it too, I've done some things that I'm not quite proud of in photography, especially when I was younger, getting way too close to owls, spooking them. And it's really, really important now that I've learned about these birds a bit more and um, how they survive, that it's important we understand ethics and photography. So the first thing I want to mention is flight photography, which a lot of people really, really, really love the up close fight, flight photography of owls. And this is a burrowing owl in California and he's catching a, a little iridescent green beetle. I think this one is called a Japanese green June bug, I believe. And um, it was really cool to watch him zoom around and hunt for these little beetles. Um, but anyways, unfortunately, a lot of times um, photographers will try and get shortcuts to get a little bit better uh, flight shots and people have taken to purchasing mice and rodents from the pet store and they'll come out and they'll put the mouse underneath a um, plastic dome and basically torture the owls and the owl will come in and try and get the mouse and obviously it can't because there's a dome over it and all the photographers are getting their you know the beautiful flight shots and then the mouse is obviously harassed and the owls harassed but it's not so much the harassment that is um, detrimental to the the birds but what is what is um, the consequence that comes from feeding wild animals is they become habituated and not so much 
uh, for owls, they become habituated to people, but they become habituated to the roadside. And since owls are low flying birds, they are constantly struck by cars. And this is really tragic and it happens all the time. And um, baiting owls with mice is mostly common in Eastern provinces of Canada and I, the Eastern US, although it has been documented in Western, I've seen it in Washington. I've heard reports and rumors of it happening it, and it's unfortunate, but I think it's really important to remember that flight shots of owls are 100% achievable naturally, just like this one was. It's all about understanding the bird's hunting movements. So to get these flight shots, it's, it, you, gotta, you gotta understand their hunting movements. So owls, usually when they're hunting, they will find a perch to listen from because owls have these phenomenal, phenomenal hearing. So they have asymmetrical ear holes and their, uh, their facial, facial disc, which is, as you can see, like the big round area around his, around his head. Um, it's basically shaped like a satellite dish. So those tiny little feathers inside the facial disc all channel ear uh, all channel sound to his ear holes so he has basically an auditory 3d map of his surroundings so owls are just the greatest hunters because they have this evolutionary advantage of being able to triangle triangulate prey from quite a distance away so they will perch low and they'll be hunting. And the best way to um, tell if an owl is about to fly is they'll usually, they'll perk up their heads and they'll start bobbing their heads around and they'll look around and they'll get real tall on their perch. And that's usually when they're starting to hear something in the grass or under the snow and they'll start tilting their head back and forth. And that's when you have to get ready. You have to get ready and you gotta move quick and keep your eye on the owl as it's starting to move. And then if you're, if you're lucky, the owl sometimes will fly right at you. And that's what happened to me yesterday. I was watching a snowy owl for three hours. And on hour number two, after trying to get a flight shot, and it, it does take time. And obviously, if you have a pet store a mouse out in front of you, you can get a flight shot within a few seconds. But, you know, it might take a few more hours to get a flight shot, but it is definitely achievable. So yesterday, watching a snowy owl for about three hours, and... Um, She's sitting on a, on, a, on a, not a light post, but it was a telephone post. And she's looking down into um, a ditch that has a bunch of grass and reeds in it and snow. So a perfect spot for uh, voles and other rodents to live. So, you know, she's, she's hunting that spot. So knowing that she's hunting that ditch, I went around the other side of the ditch on, there was a road on the other side of the ditch, maybe a uh, hundred yards away from the owl, maybe 80 yards away from the owl. And I waited there for a good 20 minutes while she's sitting on the, on the, on the, on the post. And around the 20 minute mark, she starts, she starts lifting up her head and she starts tilting her head. And I know it's go time. She's about to fly. And she starts to flex her wings and then she takes off. And to my astonishment, she's coming right at me, directly at me. I, you know, the full face, so I, I get ready and I, I start focusing and I have her. And right as she's coming down, I start clicking my shots and I was able to get her a full front on shot of her coming down into the snow right before she was able to capture dinner. And it's really about understanding those movements of the owl while hunting. And, you know, sometimes they might fly in the opposite direction of you. Sometimes they go straight down. You never know, but that's, that's what makes wildlife photography, wildlife photography. And, you know, you got to wait and be patient for that, for that dream shot. So going along with uh, ethics of owling, um, another thing I like to encourage, a lot of people, including myself, have used flash on owls, not flash from the camera, but a flashlight, an external light source. And um, I've used this on two species of owl, the flammulated owl and the whiskered screech owl. Um, I only use flash on these species because they were life or birds for me. And uh, I only found them at 1 a.m. <laughs> so I had no, no light and it wasn't, unfortunately I didn't have any moonlight. So I had zero light for me to use to use a long exposure. So I used a, I used a flashlight. And if you are going to use the flashlights, it's really, really important to not point them at directly at the bird. I usually point them right below the bird. So just the, this, the rim light of the flashlight is touching the bird. And this, um, this doesn't harm their retinas as bad as using a flash and, you know, getting them right in the eyes. Um, but using that flashlight off to the side, I don't get any red eye shine and I'm able to take a somewhat long exposure 
uh, like a one second of them without harming them. But if they start to squint their eyes, I turn off the flashlight immediately. Um, and those encounters, it's best to keep them very short. But anyways, if you have the opportunity to not use an external light source on an owl, that is very ideal. So um, this is an example of that. This is a photo of Western screech owls in their nest cavity. And this was taken with a five second exposure. So these owls stayed 100% completely still for five seconds. And that's not uncommon for owls. Owls are known for their um, quite statue-like behavior in most cases. So these owls were coming out of their, uh, their hole and right before sunset, a little bit before sunset, I focused, I manually focused on them and I made sure that they were pin sharp on my camera and I could do fine adjustments later, but I made sure I had that initial um, focusing. And then I got back in the car and waited until dark when they started to pop their heads out of the cavity. And then when they start to come emerge from the cavity, I wait until they have a good footing on the cavity and then I start clicking away and I use a remote shutter release so that I'm not using any camera shake because if you shake the camera at all it'll completely ruin your exposure and it'll be blurry so you have to use the external um, remote shutter release so you're not moving the camera or tripod and you also have to be on a tripod <laughs> that is a requirement for a long exposure but um, so you click your shutter release and just cross your fingers and hope that the owl will stay completely still for you. And in a lot of cases, actually in most cases, I can get a shot and not just a shot, but a, a nice sharp quality image. And I think it's a great approach rather than, you know, just using your fl phone flashlight to give some extra light. It's a great challenge for the photographer to hone in on their on their photography skills and long exposure, but it's also a great opportunity um, to just ethically photograph owls and their natural behavior without having to um, shine any lights on them or anything. So another one of those uh, flight shots, this is one I got in um, Yellowstone National Park, this owl was, I had noticed that the owl was hunting from fence post to fence post and this is another great tip for understanding the, um, the owl flight behavior is if they have certain perches that they are hopping back and forth from to hunt from, you can always position yourself in front of one of those perches and then you almost have a guaranteed opportunity of them coming to your post or wherever tree or shrub that you're waiting behind and you can get a you know, head on flight shot because you know they're, they're going to come there at one point. So this was after waiting about four hours photographing these owls that finally this owl had been on a, on a post to the left and he was flying to the right and I'm over and I'm right in front of his, of his post and he's coming into the post on the right and I just happened to be able to get that, that full flight shot while he was coming in. But it is, you know, really important to just keep it with patience and they will come along and they will, you will get that shot. And I feel like a lot of times, you know, we've moved into the instant gratification of wanting to get that good photo now and right at this moment, but it, it really is in the best spirit of wildlife photography to have that virtue of patience and, and to just wait on the animal to naturally, um, for natural behaviors as that's, that is the, um, the best tip I can give you in starting your owl photography is try to leave no trace and try to leave the owl just as you found it in its natural stance. And um, yeah, I think, I do believe that concludes this presentation. Izzy, that is a fantastic, uh, wonderful presentation. And it is so refreshing to hear um, your approach uh, and your ethical approach to uh, photographing these birds. I know, um, you know, being, being an active uh, photographer in Minnesota and the uh, owl eruptions that we have, uh, a lot of these issues uh, have come up um, with the baiting and the um, invasion of their space. And there are a lot of people that rush to these sites. I know that, I've seen it. Um, and so it's really nice to get that, very refreshing to get that perspective from you, a, a young woman and somebody who is um, the future of the birding and naturalist world and, and hearing you say those things is great. Um, I've got a few questions for you. 
Uh, I promised Izzy that I would keep this fairly short. She's got homework that she's got to do, so we don't want to go too long. Uh, if you have questions for Izzy, you can either put them in the chat and I'll try to follow that. Or if you want to ask them directly, you can raise your hand and, and I can do that. So I, the first one I'm going to ask you is, of course, I'm a photographer. A lot of the people here are photographers and they're going to be curious about your gear. And I don't want to dwell on it too long, but what kind of camera do you use and what's your go-to lens? And just tell us a little bit about your equipment. Yes, this is definitely my number one question I'm always getting. So I started with the uh, 7D, I actually started with the 40D when I first started photographing. My dad had an extra camera body. So that's what I started with. That's what the snowy owl picture was taken with and the solid owl picture was taken with in my first couple slides. But then I quickly moved to the 7D Mark II as my dad is really into photography, but he doesn't, he doesn't get out much and he usually gets out maybe once every couple of months. So I just started borrowing his 7D Mark II, which quickly became not so much borrowing and I was using it every day, which <laughs> I feel a little bit bad about, but it's all, it's all paid good now because um, uh, just a couple months ago, I was able to use the money that I have made through actually print sales and workshops to purchase my very first camera body. I bought the R5. So I have been shooting on the R5 for a couple months now and I love it. Um, personally, I do not think the IAF focus is all what it's cracked up to be. It will not focus on my barred owls or my ducks at my local pond, but I think their eyes might be a bit too dark for that. But other than that, the R5 is an incredible mirrorless camera. And along with that, um, my buddy lent me a 4028, the original, so the 14 pound one. <laughs> <laughs> Canon. And uh, I'm so, so grateful for that. He's letting me sell it for him. And in the meantime, I'm able to use it for up to, to a year while I'm selling it. So I'm really wow. excited about that. Cool. Um, but I've been using that for a couple of years, or not a couple of years, sorry, a couple of months as well. And before that, and I still use my Sigma 150 to 600 contemporary. Uh, that's a, actually a very solid lens. I used to own one of those. I'll give you a little tip with the 4028 if you haven't heard this already. You can actually stack doublers or 1.4 teleconverters if you put a uh, extension tube between them because they oh. have the protruding glass on those things. So you put an extension tube between the two of them. So you can add out like a 1.4 and then another 1.4 teleconverter with an extension tube. You can't okay. focus real far away. It limits you as far as your distance. Mm -hmm. um, but with those prime lenses that are fast, it has very little or no uh, effect on the autofocus speed um, and sharpness. So, um, so what is next for you with regard to your bird photography? Are you, are you branching into other areas of bird photography? Yeah, so um, in 2020, I have set a goal for myself, as you mentioned earlier, I wanted to photograph all 19 of America's owl species in a calendar year before my 18th birthday, and I was able to complete that goal on December 26th with the Frugnus pygmy owl. And um, but the unfortunate part of my goal was I missed getting photographs of two species. Um, the elf owl, my encounter was at 1.30 a.m. and the owl was not interested in sticking around for me to stick up my flashlight for a photo. And um, so he, that was a no. And then the boreal owl, exact same circumstance. It was like a couple hours after sunset in Mount Rainier National Park and he was not up for the, uh, the photograph opportunity. Um, so I'm hoping this year, I'm trying to do the goal again. <laughs> I'm going to okay. do it again and try and get a picture of every bird. But apart from that, I am branching out into other uh, realms of bird photography. And lately it's been waterfowl. And I am so in love with those low angle bokeh images. And I've started photographing my local buffleheads, widgeons, and wood ducks at the park. I've been watching some of that imagery, some of that pond imagery that you've been posting on Facebook. And it's absolutely beautiful. And for those of you that are listening, if you aren't friends with Izzy, you should go and check her out on Facebook. She posts regularly and it's beautiful work. I noticed the tie-in when you were talking about the pygmy owl that you photographed in those branches with the blue uh, and, and warm spot tones in the blue and real sort of ethereal uh, and soft, very soft environment. That mimicked a lot of the work that you're doing right now with that pond mm -hmm. photography, which I I 
uh, I love too. I think those are gorgeous images. They're just beautiful. So I'm going to put you on the spot here just a little bit. Um, do you have a life list? And if you do, how many birds do you have on it? That's like, I, I've never counted how many birds I've ever seen. I've, I've never done that. I, I know a lot of my friends do. And I think so, one of these days I want to sit down and get a bird book out and just start numbering off the species that I've seen because I have no idea. Okay. Yeah, not Cornell sure. has a, a great app for that. That will keep track mm -hmm. of it for you if you want. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, it's the Cornell uh, bird. What is it called? The, the I have it right here. Uh, it is the the oh it's merlin merlin bird id it's put out by the cornell labs so, oh yeah and, yeah okay I'll, I'll look that up i have the i have the merlin bird id but i didn't know that they kept track of like numbers or whatnot yeah you can do oh. a whole life list on there so yeah and also, what's, nice, what's nice about it is you can take your photographs you just take a picture of it with your phone and then it'll go through that whole id thing for you oh nice put it on your life list so Great. um i have a couple questions regarding sort of place. Um, is there a place in Washington state that you care to share that's sort of like Saxem, your go-to place for wanting to look for owls? Unfortunately, we don't have a place in Washington that has like, like Saxem, unfortunately, or else I'd be there and not here. <laughs> but um, uh, we have, unfortunately, a lot of the species like here in, here in Minnesota are, I feel like I can spend a day and I'll find like a whole bunch of different species of owls and with like within 40 minutes of the city. And I think that's insane because in Seattle, I'll see like maybe a barred owl and a great horned owl on the same day, but finding like a sawwit or a Western screech owl is virtually impossible on, all on the same day. So they definitely don't congregate as densely I've seen as they do around the city here. Um, but for some good spots to see owls in Washington, Discovery Park has multiple species. They're just very elusive and um, usually you can guarantee a barred owl there, but they have sawwits and longeards and great horns and barn owls, but they're, you know, every once in a while you'll spot them, um, but they're not as, uh, not as habitual or frequent. We also have a place in uh, the Skagit Flats. Skagit Flats is amazing for shorted owls. Um, all over the Skagit Flats, there's multiple places, hot spots that people like to go to, but I try not to go to the hot spots just because I'm not a fan of the crowds. But um, anywhere down there have the, have the shorted owls and they come in huge numbers. Sometimes you can find them in fields hunting in numbers of like 10 to 20, all just hunting around the field. So those are good places to get guaranteed sightings. But Washington, it doesn't, unfortunately, it's not a great place for um, just a uh, a, like a, a great population of owls around the city. Like if you were to go to Seattle, you wouldn't be seeing much. Um, but definitely out in the rural Eastern Washington specifically, um, down in Blue Mountain Range, Okanagan Mountain Range, those are great for all sorts of different species of owl. I think they have like upwards to maybe seven species that you could pretty regularly find there. Cool. Um, do you work with any conservation groups? Have you worked yeah. with them? Yeah. And... So Ooh. I'm a part of, I was, I worked for the Global Owl Project last spring. I did burrowing owl conservation. So we were digging burrowing owl burrows, which was extremely intensive labor. It was very hard, but it was well worth it. We were out in 90 degree heat and 20 mile per hour wind in the sand, digging holes for hours. It was like the movie Holes, if you've ever seen that. <laughs> but um then in, in those moments, I got very special, maybe 10 minute chances to hold burrowing owls so I could ban them. And we were able to do some actual hands-on work with the birds, but I did that as well. And then this year, I'm gonna be working with a biologist out of Utah and we're gonna be banding flammulated owls and that'll be fun. And then I'm hoping the year after that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and sign up for an internship with uh, the Owl Research Institute of Charlo, Montana, and they're out uh, doing, their interns look for great gray owl nests and all that. And so I'm hoping to follow along with that in a couple of years. We've got two questions from participants so far. Um, and one uh, relates to uh, Jodell Cruz is asking, she had a barred owl in her backyard um, and it seemed to be a uh, number of robins were harassing it and causing it to move. Uh, and she asked, are there other birds that will harass owls? And, and am, if you want to talk about that yeah. a little bit. 
I am so glad that she asked this question because I completely forgot to include it in my presentation. But that is actually like my number two tip of how to find owls is mobbing birds. Mobbing birds are so, so helpful. Terrible for the owls, but very helpful for photographers and finding them. So chickadees, um, all corvid species. So corvids are blue jays, uh, stellar's jays, um, crows they will all harass owls. Um, particularly chickadees, I've seen them do it quite a bit. They'll gang up in mobs of upwards to 10 members and they'll just all go for the head of the owl and they'll dive bomb and they usually don't. So when an owl is mobbing, or sorry, when a uh, passerine or corvid species is mobbing an owl, they're not gonna be using their regular calls that they would be when naturally, they're gonna be using alarm calls. So listening for jays going, ah, 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 like screaming, just these alarm calls, and then chickadees do their jeep, 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 and um, just these very upset noises from um, prey species of um, prey animals, like the smaller passerines. You're very good at your bird sounds. <laughs> They're great. Uh, I once witnessed a northern hack owl up at Sax Zim's bog that was being harassed by some crows, and it was just like, you know, these crows were harassing and harassing it, and he just finally just sort of said, oh, the hell with this man. And he kicked in the afterburners and he was gone. That, bur <laughs> that, that owl is fast. So oh, yeah. it was kind of fun to watch. Um, yeah. Tina Penny asks, what advice would you give the younger generation in getting involved in conservation, which is obviously a, a big part of your life? Yeah. So also, hi, Tina. She's my friend. <laughs> but, um, uh, so... Uh, yeah, with going along with helping getting kids involved in conservation, I'm like, I'm really interested in that. And that's like one of my main um, passions is getting especially children involved in the natural world because like they are our future. And I mean, I guess I'm also kind of a kid, but <laughs> they are our future. And I really want to encourage kids to like start getting out and and seeing nature. And mostly the way I've been doing that is actually going through the parents and I'll have parents talk to me. And um, I'll be talking to parents. I'm like, have you ever thought about, you know, getting your kids out to see nature? And they're like, you know, we go on hikes and stuff, but we've never actually looked for animals before. And so I'll give them tips and places to go see um, animals. And one time I was in my local park, Discovery Park, actually looking for barred owls. And this uh, barred owl comes out and um, he's hanging out with us. And he, uh, he flew away before this, this family came down, but a, a dad comes down with his stroller and he has four kids with him. And uh, he was just asking me questions about the birds and the kids seemed very interested. And he said he's never seen an owl before. Anyways, that was a few months ago. And I got a message um, on one of my posts recently from the same guy he had found me on social media. And he said, you know, thank you so much for, you know, talking to us that one day. Uh, we have been finding owls in our local park for the past few months now, and my kids are obsessed. We now have uh, binoculars that we're watching the local birds with, and they all want to, they all have bird species that they want to see now. And I just thought that was, that was really heartwarming to see that the kids had gotten so interested and involved. But other than just personally talking one-on-one -on -one with kids and parents, I don't have a way to reach uh, an audience of kids right now to help inspire, but I would love like any opportunity or avenue to get involved with that. I would easily jump on it because that's one of my great passions. Um, uh, Gail Merton has a question. Gail, do you want to go ahead and ask Izzy the question? Um, sure. I was just very impressed by how knowledgeable you are about not only owls, but other types of birds as well. And I was just wondering who's taught you or where do you get your information? Do you, like, how have you learned it? I know it's easy to just pick up stuff, but just curious, is there someone in your family? Or? So I learned a lot of like about the natural world, honestly, a lot from my dad. My dad has always been really interested in science and cool facts. So he really, when I was younger, he started really getting my mind working on uh, just different science facts. So I've always kind of adapted to just wanting to learn and know more about like the natural world. So recently, um, well, I uh, started, when I enrolled in college, we have these databases on my Green River College website through our, our online library that is, um, that Green River pays for, I think it's like $30,000 a month they pay for these databases. 
and um, you can only access them as a student, but I've used that opportunity to do all of my owl research through these databases because they have these peer reviewed articles from biologists that actually, you know, spend their entire lives studying different owl species and they'll give you all the morphological different um, different aspects of the owls. And that's a great way I've learned is just reading these peer reviewed scholarly articles from people's different, you know, theses about owls and their different research projects um, on different species. I've learned quite a bit about um, through that avenue. Very cool. So you're, you are in college. You're, you're enrolled in college right now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here's a really dumb question. Um, what's your, uh, what's your major? <laughs> I actually don't have, um, I'm just doing a general AA. So I'm actually enrolled in this program through my high school called Running Start. I'm not sure if you guys offer it throughout the United States, but I think it's primarily a West Coast thing. Um, Minnesota has a similar program. Yeah. Yeah. So basically for anybody who's not familiar with that, Running Start is a program for high school students that feel like they uh, you have to do a placement test and uh, it's basically jumping ahead two years so you can start your um, your two years of college a lot of people a lot of kids mostly just start their first two years of college they'll take a few college classes so they can have credits to transfer to whatever university they go to but I decided to go the hardcore route and um, I completely dropped out of my local high school and um, called as a um, I guess a homeschooled student so I'm getting I'm going to graduate through my local college and um, I was able to do the full two years so I'm on track to graduate this spring uh, with my associate's degree as well as my um, my diploma for high school. Very good. Bruce Barnes asks have you been to the Saxon blog before or is this your first trip? This is my very first trip. You'll have a great time. I'm excited. It's a beautiful place. Are you um, are you going to uh, meet uh, Sparky Stensis by chance? Uh, I am not familiar with that name. Okay, you need to look up Sparky and introduce yourself to him. He's one of the main instigators for the Saxon Bog and the visitor center there and all this okay. stuff that's going on. And um, he, he would be a great resource for you uh, going up there, especially. Um, how many states did you go to? I've just got a couple more questions and then we'll let you get to your homework. Um, how many states did you go to to get your, to fulfill your, um, your goal? Uh, 17 states and three countries. <laughs> so wow. it was um, Canada, when before COVID shut down the border in March, I had a great trip to Alberta for quite a while. I spent up there. We had northern hawk owl, great gray owl, snowy owl, all those uh, northern species. And um, then I had to make my trip to, at, one, at some point I had to make a trip to Arizona to get those species that only live in Arizona, which is the whiskers screech owl, the elf owl, and the frigginous pygmy owl. So I had to make sure I shot down there at some point to get those. But unfortunately, while I was down there, I didn't get the frigginous pygmy owl. And um, I was thinking, wow, I'm really going to end my goal incomplete. And I'm only going to have 18 out of the 19. And so last minute, my mom, uh, she messages me. We don't, unfortunately, our family isn't very into holidays or Christmas at all. And we just have never, have never really celebrated. And she said, hey, do you want to celebrate Christmas with me in Mexico? And I'm like, really? And she's like, yeah, I'll get you a plane ticket. We can, we can go. And I was like, wow, so we, we have a friend there that lives there. And it was a very surprisingly cheap trip to get down there and it was only like it was it was really really awesome and so I'm down there and I'm just thinking to myself freaking is pig meow I had always thought of them as an Arizona bird species I never considered like do they live down here <laughs> so I go on their range map and I look up you know where does the freaking is pig meow live and right there in Quintana Roo is one of their hot spots in Mexico so I go on my local eBird and iNaturalist, I'm trying to find any last minute information I can to get my 19th species and I was able to befriend a, nat, um, a friend and I was a uh, befriend a friend. <laughs> I was able to befriend a local down there. And um, she she said that she's um, seen the Brugnus pygmy in her backyard all the time. So we had this magical journey to uh, Playa del Carmen and we found the Brugnus pygmy on December 26th. And unfortunately it was not photographed in the USA which is what I'm trying to fulfill this year. Okay. Uh, Mexico is yeah. a great place. I travel there regularly and, 
and uh, there's a wonderful place, a wonderful birder, uh, birder down there in, in a town called Alamos. Uh, that's a lot of fun, and I'm planning a trip down there uh, next year for uh, one of my workshops. Um, so the, my last question for you is, when is the book coming out? Ah, <laughs> that's the question I get. That's like the second most asked question. Um, I've actually, so my dad is very, very encouraging of me trying to start a book. However, my dad is not so keen on me starting an owl book. Well, kind of. He wants me to write children's books because a lot of people don't know this about me, but I'm really, I'm really into drawing and art. And I've been drawing since I was a little kid. And I, I really focused on orcas when I was little because I was so obsessed with the killer whales. And I would draw these orcas. And I actually wrote a book about orcas. I wrote actually maybe three books about orcas now and um, the different uh, natural lines and families that we have in the Puget Sound. And my dad wants me to write a children's book about banding burrowing owls, which I actually I'm, I'm in on. I, I really want to. And I kind of want to right and it'll be a little bit you know introducing so going along with tina's question about getting it out conservation to children um i kind of would use that as an avenue to explain owl banding through the eyes of the owl and explain how important it is for research purposes and under like you know understanding their movements at the end of the book but throughout the book i think it'll mostly be about you know just uh, the story of an owl getting banded and how it's a scary experience but it's worth it in the end <laughs> I have a very good friend who is one of the top published children's books author. So you get ready to do that. You just shoot me a message and I can put you in touch with her. You could pick her brain a little bit on it. She's awesome. Very, thank you. Yeah, very well published. Well, Izzy, I want to thank you very much for a really wonderful uh, presentation. It's been really informative, beautiful photographs and um, good luck with your work and good luck with your homework tonight. <laughs> and, uh, I hope we have a chance to cross paths sometime. Yeah, me too. Thank you so much for having me on. And I was, it was a pleasure to give a presentation. You bet. Thank you. All righty. Bye-bye. Have a nice evening, everyone.